thank you to the organizer for this amazing conference. And thank you all for coming, despite this being early after the conference dinner. The wine was good, so I put the background dark so that if you're coming over, hopefully it's still not too unpleasant. <coughs> this is joint work with a bunch of people, so my talk is going to be a little bit of an overview of what's going on in categorical mobility. In this case, from the point of view of universal properties, it's a relatively new field. Uh, as I will say, it was uh, unsurprisingly started by Lovere, but unlike other fields started by Lovere, it lay like dormant for like several decades. And only now we're starting to see some uh, intense activity in the field. So first of all, why universal properties? So I want to say the universal properties are the trademark of category theory in the sense that when you apply category theory to a new topic, say probability, the first thing you can do is express some stuff of probability in the language of, say, commutative diagrams. But of course, a lot of people may argue that's just language. You could also just do it in the old language, and there's not much difference mathematically. It, it might help you, but it, there's not a substantial difference. However, once you write something in the language of commutative diagrams, and you run into a universal property, that's it. Then you're doing category theory. It's actually even really hard to express a universal property without using category theory. And so I want to see which situations in probability theory will make, in some sense, category theory unavoidable. So for an example, uh, suppose in, in topology, you have a region A, imagine this fifth region, uh, C-shaped region, and another one with intersection E. So you all know this is a push-out in the category of topological spaces. And now if you take, say, the first homology functor of whatever version you want, <coughs> well then, of course the diagram will still commute, but it's not a push-out anymore, right? So that's how the whole business of homology was probably started. First with like minor of sequences, then with like homology of functors, and then you can go to direct categories and so on, okay? Uh, so, if you just look at this from the point of view of commutative diagrams, you'll see, okay, commutes on the left, commutes on the right, where's the problem? But you, if you don't know universal properties, you still may start to think that to suspect something, that like, something is going on. Like, it it's still commutes on the right, but, but there, there is something up here. So, either our functor, like H1, is detecting some kind of non-connectedness or not preserving something, and um, the field of homological algebra was basically invented to accept this property and use it to your advantage. Like it detects something. What are all the things you can detect this way? Okay? Um, and that's also usually where an algebraic topology course takes a little break and opens a chapter or a section on categories and functors. I'm, I'm sure most of us were first um, introduced to categories this way. That was the case for myself as well. So exactly 10 years ago, at the theory university here in Lundin, I first heard about category, categories and functors this way. At that point, I was not doing categories. So the question is right. At what place in probability textbook should one stop and start a chapter on categories? OK? All right, so first of all, Easy question. What is probability theory? Now, what is probability theory? So one thing I want to argue, uh, I, I want to say in some sense, paraphrasing of the year, I hope I'm not misunderstanding you, but is that probability theory is not about measurable spaces such that the total mass is one. I mean, it's not like it's not about them at all. But that's just the first step. And like the point of doing probability is not doing measure one measure spaces, okay? So it's like it's like saying, I don't know, uh, going home is not about the bricks that have made the home, kind of. Uh, for, for, a, for an analogy, a real analysis is not about strings of even digits, such that 0 0.999 is 1. Of course, that's one way you can construct real numbers. So in a very low sense, it is about that, but that's not like the point of the whole field, okay? So what probability theory mostly is about is about making predictions in situations of randomness. It's one, it's probably the most applied area of mathematics, especially if 
to include statistics. And it, it has a very, very strong predictive power. So the whole point is not just stopping at the measure space, which is kind of like saying, here we have randomness. But then we go one step forward and say, all right, great, what can we still say? And even, how can we use randomness as a resource? A little bit like before, the fact that pushouts were not preserved, it can become something you can use to your advantage. And here we will see randomness can be used to our advantage as well, because with randomness come stochastic interaction and correlations, and those allow you to make predictions that you would not even see in a non-random case. More of that in a moment. All right? So the usual problem in probability theory is something like we have some x. Usually x is some kind of sequence or process. And then you have some y, which is usually some kind of limited thing. The fact that x and y have some correlation with uh, will allow you to make predictions about y based on x, all right? So for, I guess, half of you were in this talk on Monday by Ruben Van Bella about so the Martigan convergence theorem. That's the perfect example of what people do in probability. So you have a bunch of measure spaces that are related in their way, in, in a certain way, and knowing some of them will have information about the, the missing one, okay? So in order to talk about different things and how they interact, we can use the language of model category. So uh, it's uh, borrowing from, from people doing uh, quantum probability and so on, we can use string diagrams, but these are absolutely classical. In case you're not familiar, uh, a morphism from x to y is a box going from up, uh, down to up. So we're pointing our arrows up. And uh, most of our examples you can Think of a morphism as being a map, like some, imagine a function that has some randomness. So, for example, here you see from each point of the set A, we have transitions to the points of X with some probabilities. Okay? So, concretely, this is going to be a matrix, and each entry of the matrix is a number from 0 to 1, and the sum of the columns, the sum of each column is going to be 1. So, it's a stochastic matrix with their usual composition. So that's, that category is called this on. The morphism <coughs> for the monoidal unit, we, we don't represent the monoidal unit, I mean, by coherence it's not too wrong, and um, we denote that by triangles. Those are, in some sense, probability measures. Like, you see, if you have a, a transition from just a single point, these are just numbers that sum to one, so you can view that equivalently as some probability measure there. In this case, it's green. Okay? And you can imagine that push forward this probability measure is going to be composing this morphism with this morphism and so on. So we have all the power of category here. But most importantly, this is monoidal. So the monoidal product of two morphisms denotes something like these two things happen independently from one another. Uh, so for a case of first talk, we're just saying that the product of the, the transitions on the product is the product of the transitions. You know, like when you have two independent coins, the product of probability is the probability of the product because they're independent. That's this situation. Of course, in general, we will have uh, more complicated morphisms where like x can have an effect on b, or even we will see where y can have an effect on b when you do inference. Like knowing one of these will tell you something about the other ones. Okay? In the continuous case, and uh, that's where like we have to really do some. Uh, more advanced measure theory to get to set up the categorical formalism, but we've done it years ago. But it's the category for us, where objects are, let me say, nice measurable spaces. So, and morphisms are Markov kernels, which are, let me say, the non discrete version of stochastic measure. So instead of going from point to point with some probability, uh, usually points with tend to have probability zero now, so you have to go from a point to a measurable set. So now the rows and the columns of the matrix look different. One, you have sets and one, you have points. And uh, you need a condition of measurability because, uh, well, to compose this instead of a sum now for, for the, the equivalent of the matrix composition, you have an integral. And so you want basically y to be a variable in which our things are measurable so that this makes sense. A little bit of history. This category was first defined by Lavier in the 60s. And uh, when Lavier was working on arms control, and then he moved on to other things and never did this basically ever again, and never published this. 
So this went under the radar and uh, completely independently, Chensov in Soviet Russia defined the very same category. And also then just moved on to other things like geometry. He did publish, but in Russian. And so for decades, nobody really went on to this until much later. So this uh, is how the thing was started, but then uh, there was a very long break. And uh, very interestingly, Lovier defined this category, but never defined axioms that categories like this should satisfy. Like, they didn't do like he did, for example, uh, you know, Wittkog and others uh, for doing synthetic convergent geometry or, or other things. And uh, that's one of the main things that we want to do here. What, so this category is nice. Which of its basic properties and, and properties on, on the function of this category characterize probability theories? Right. So, um, the main universal properties we're going to see is first one is a non universal property. I want to argue that we do not want categorical products here. It's crucial. Um, then I'm going to talk about what to do with infinite sequences using Kolmogorov extension theorem. Some of you have heard of it already on Monday. Then we're going to talk about quality monads and the Kleistian junction. So, that's one of the universal properties that I'm sure you all know already. Uh, not for probability, but for junctions. And then I conclude with one of the main theorems we have so far, one of the flagship uh, statements of probability, the Fenetis theorem, which can be expressed interestingly as, and proven using uh, just limits in the sense of category. All right, why not products? <coughs> well, let's first start with an intuitive explanation. Uh, products imply this universal property. In particular, it implies universal property for morphisms from the monoidal unit, which we have said are probability measures. So suppose you have a product space and two probability measures here and here. Then you would need to have a unique probability distribution that's projected down to these ones when you marginalize. Let me forget about the other fact. In this case, you see, if we know we are in this point, then this joint tells you that we are on the left side of actual probability 1. But this is not the only probability measure you can put there that would project down. This one would do the same job, and instead you see, knowing what y is with the little x on the right. So we see two things here. First of all, that we have existence, but not non-uniqueness. And second, that yeah, there is randomness, but you see, these two randomness are related in some way, in such a way that there's some shared information, there's some shared randomness that allows you to make predictions about x for knowing why. So products are not here, but because we have a choice when the stuff isn't here, these different choices encode different information that X can tell you about Y or Y can tell you about X. So I want to argue the lack of products is going to be a feature that we can use. Let's make all of these more precise. Um, so a mark of category Yes, please. Another question. So, you have a monoidal product, and yeah. are you now arguing that the monoidal product should not be a categorical product? Yes. Or, okay, okay. I was thinking that you're arguing the category should not have product. Oh, no, okay, sure. Uh, the category is <coughs> allowing to have products if they happen to be there, um, but those are not the structure we want to form a product of probability. And we can also say a little bit more the category is allowed to have Komono instructions on the objects, but not the one that we make. So, so in a, we are very close to like not actually having products. <coughs> it's true, we don't, do not want the, the absence of products. Um, okay, so the Markov category, uh, yeah, oh, there's a question. Uh, Markov category, so I use the definitions uh, following Fritz, but a lot of other people have defined several uh, similar structures independently. Okay, so this is just uh, the latest iteration. Uh, it's a symmetric monoidal category where each object has a specified committed common structure with the usual commonoid axiom, so the two two monoids. And uh, we can interpret this as copying and discarding. So in this case you see, for example, the coefficient TVT tells you that copying one of the copies is the same as copying the other copy. The co-unitality tells you that copying and deleting one of the copies is the same as doing nothing. 
there's an explicit flip side. And the symmetry tells you that two copies can be interchanged. In some sense, they look the same. Right? Um, so it's fine. That uh, we want it to be semi Cartesian, so this property is in some of the other definitions dropped. It has to do with normalization of probability, so it kind of makes things a little bit simpler for us, but it's not essential. But what, uh, what we do need is compatibility with the monoidal product. So you want the monoidal structure of the tensor product to be the tensor product of the monoids, sorry, co Okay. All right, uh, that's the Markov category. And so uh, this copy of is crucial if we want to talk about correlations whenever there are inputs. So here is what we can do with this. Um, first of all, in set and in every Cartesian monoidal category, there exists a unique common structure for every object, this one. Okay? And you can prove that by the universal property of the product, there are no other ones, up to isomorphism of commonants. In Finstock, well, Finstock is like, kind of admits finite sets as a subcategory, in some sense. So we inherit the copy mock from there, which are like the monoidal uh, the, the, the common given by the diagonal maps, like the set. So that's this stochastic matrix. It loses the universal property, but the map is still there. Okay, so you just copy this value. And the stock is the same, except that <coughs> now it's in the continuous case, so it's against the kind of diagonal map. Alright, so we say that a morphism in a Markov category that has two outputs exhibits conditional independence of these two outputs if and only if, let me say, you can cut it along the middle line and divide it into two blocks. Okay? So forgetting, so basically copying the input and then applying separately the output and keeping x discarding y. Keeping y discarding x is the same as this. In some sense, the intuition <laughs> is to say that, okay, we have randomness here. So, knowing A will not necessarily give you all the information you want about X and Y, because there's some randomness. <laughs> However, knowing A and knowing X might give you some information about Y. That's what we were doing here before we correlation. Now, we're saying that this doesn't happen here. Since we can split this, if you know A, then X cannot give you any more extra information about Y. Because you see, they don't, the blocks don't touch. For states in particular, it's just this, which tells you that knowing X will give, will give you no information about Y. Like one coin flip and the next one, if you know this. This looks a little bit philosophical, but we can do hard numbers. Let's say for the case of states, that's exactly saying that the probability is the product of the probabilities of the marginals. And for non-states, like for things that have an input, it's kind of the same, and you see why we have to copy A, because here, we have to use the same input twice. So this is not A and A prime, it's A and A. So we have to copy it, and that's where the copy marks come from. Right? And of course, the discard marks come from the fact that, for example, this is just P of X, not P of X. <laughs> Similarly, we say that a morphism is deterministic if it is conditionally independent from itself, which looks a bit, again, cryptic, but what I mean is that we can cut this this way. And uh, this is an interpretation that the deterministic thing is something that will give you the same result if you do it twice. That's kind of... So let, let's give you an example. Suppose that F takes numbers and might add either 2 or 3 to the number with probability 1 half and 1 half. So you start with 2, deterministically, let's say, and then you might be mapped with either to either 4 or 5, with probability half and half. And now you copy whatever you have. So you see that you don't know if you're going to have 4, 4, or 5, 5, but you know they're going to be equal. In particular, knowing what the first copy is will tell you everything about the second one. There's perfect correlation. So here, knowing this one output will give you perfect predictions about the other. On the other hand, on the right hand side, take two and copy, so it's two twice, now two dimensions. And now apply your map twice, you see that, well, the first one could be either four or five, the second one two. <coughs> so in the second situation, given the input, knowing one of the copies will tell you nothing about the other ones, everything is right? 
So here we have conditional independence given the input, if I split it. Here we have perfect correlation given the input. It's a little bit like entanglement in quantum mechanics, but it's not. Uh, this is purely classical, it's actually much simpler than entanglement. It's just correlation. All right? But you see, if f was just a function, like deterministic, then of course both copies are just not f of x, f of x, and this would have no difference. We take this as our definition of determinism. And uh, again, oops, sorry. you can prove that, uh, okay, first states is just this. And if you do the math, then it's actually says that p of x is p of x squared. So p of x is either 0 or 1. So we are absolutely certain of which events are going to happen and which are going to not happen, at least almost sure. All right? So for this stuff, those are exactly those stochastic matrices that are just functions. I'm giving the examples of Finsta, but you can use uh, Borel's block with general measurable spaces, and it's a little bit more involved, but you get exactly the same thing. So also in this case, you get those zero one measures. Yes? And we can find the categories in the stock category. Uh, you use them a lot in your examples, but I don't know the definition of them. Oh, it's a category of stochastic matrices with their composition. Okay. So matrices that have the columns as some to one of positive matrices. So, <coughs> so again, this gives us the, the usual notion of determinism for most of our examples. All right, now what I want to argue is that if f is deterministic, and this is getting to the crucial point here, if f is deterministic, then you can split it. For every deterministic map, knowing x will give you no additional information about y that you might have from it. So, so to say philosophically, what's the, what's the rationale? Well, if this is deterministic, there's no information that x is withholding you about y that you wouldn't have known from a. Because this is deterministic. It's imagine a function. If you want to know what the value of y is, well, just take f of a and take the second component. There's no reason to want to know x. Right? And, uh, well, let's just apply the axioms of uh, Markov category. You see, copying this is the tensor of the copies, then you discard and use the determinism of f now. You get this. Alright? And that brings us to the first proposition. The following things are equivalent. First of all, every morphism exhibits conditional independence. Well, that implies every morphism is deterministic. Because remember, we define determinism as conditional independence from yourself. From 2 to 1, it's exactly this number. <coughs> But now, these other situations, you see, that those are just rephrasing, sorry, of the fact that um, that this type of commutes. Every morphism is deterministic, that's the definition of commutes with copy. That's the same thing as copy is a natural transformation. But we already know that discard is natural, so that's saying that C is a Cartesian monotone cap. So, again, of course, a Cartesian monotone category is a Markov category, however, it does not really encode what people do in probability theory. Because all the predictions that you can make in that case are just deterministically from the inputs and not inferentially from knowing some of the outputs. So that's like really not what probability theorists do. So again, you can apply the theory of Markov categories here, but you might not want to because the theory of Cartesian monotonic categories is much more established and simple. All right. So that is the rigorous way to say why we don't want products, but what we gain is that you can infer from an output to the next one. All right. Now, what's the second thing that probabilities do? So I said that usually they like working with sequences, infinite sequences. So a stochastic process in an equivalent definition that's a bit friendlier for uh, doing category is basically a probability measure on this countably infinite product, which you can see as a space of infinite sequences denoting time. If you want uh, continuous time, of course, you have to put R here, but we have not studied that case yet. You see, already here, uh, we know exactly what is the infinite Cartesian product, right? It's just a product. But there's no such thing as an infinite monoidal product. We just know what the finite ones are. So we immediately run into a problem here. Um, thankfully, okay, if you have a, cur a category with products and an infinite set and an infinite collection of objects, well then, 
you can take all the finite products in that in that collection, the finite in many factors, and they will give you this with the, with the product projections. They will give you these uh, co-filter type, right? It's a little bit like when you express a union as a filter co-limit of finite subsets, but do all of them. And then the product of all of them is just going to be the co-filter limit of all these finite products. That is the strategy we're going to follow. So, given a Markov category, and then if you set, we call a Kolmogorov product, this co-filter limit, we're now here, we take the, uh, sorry, here I should have put the tensor products, okay? So the finite level, we take the tensor products, but then we take this co-filter limit, and we still have the projections because we are semi-cartesian one. So we want, how to go from here to here, this, this uh, object is canonically isomorphic to this one, and so this mark is just the identity on xi times the square map on xj, and so on, okay? So we, we define their infinite product as the uh, co-filter limit of the finite products with some compatibility conditions with the Markov structure. So first of all, you want this to be preserved by tensor products. So in the Cartesian model, the case is automatic because this is a limit and this is a limit, so limits preserve limits. Here, we have to require it, it's not guaranteed. And also, we want uh, the arrows of the limiting one to be deterministic, just like projections. This guarantees that if you restrict to the subcategory of deterministic morphisms, that it is the categorical problem. Because remember, deterministic stuff is good with Cartesian products, the problem is that we have more maps. But on the old maps, this recovers the categorical problem. And, all right, uh, now can we do this? Does this give us something of probability? Yes. Kolmogorov's extension theorem can be categorically rephrased in an equivalent way by saying that Borat's and other categories too have countable Kolmogorov products, hence the name. It's quite funny that Kolmogorov did not state this using category theory because this result is 15 to 20 years older than category theory. So it's a universal property until the term. Yes? This question. So a Markov category might not have a Kolmogorov product, but something satisfying those axioms would be extra structure of a Markov category? Is that yes. So I, 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 I get to that in a moment. Yes, so this is something we want to have in our Markov category. And the, the, the good news is that the categories that you usually use to the probability that have this. Finstock doesn't because, I mean, it's, it's infinite stuff, so we would, you would have to keep the infinite set here. It's, that cannot work. But with measurable stuff, this is the case, and we also have also other examples that are more exotic. Seem not to have to do much with probability, but you can still apply it. Yeah. Yeah, Finstock does not have Kolmogorov products because you would need this to be an infinite set. And the objects of Finstocks are finite sets. So there we don't have it, but it's not too bad that we wouldn't expect it to be there. But one can take some uh, like pro-finite completion and that way one gets some instance and screen. Alright, so now I want to argue that this tells us that all these uh, correlations, stochastic interactions that we talked about, because of this property, are only finite, really, or like pro-finite, in a sense, co-finite. Uh, really, we don't have a term for that, uh, but I hope I'm going to be uh, making clear what I mean by that. So to do that, we have to talk about probability moment. What is a probability moment? <coughs> well, unfortunately, at this stage, a probability monad is like a forgetful functor, as in, there's no definition, you know one when you see one. However, we want to change this. Uh, we would like to make them a little bit more like, say, homology functor, with like the Eilenberg standard axioms or something like that. We are still looking for the, what the fundamental properties of this should be. Um, but there are a couple of things that we for sure want, and uh, we're closing into like all of them. So the first two properties that we want were actually already figured out uh, by Anderskog in the 60s and 70s. Uh, we want, uh, if we are in a Cartesian monad category, so a category with just determinism, we want to put a monad on it that makes things random in some sense, so such that its Kleisley category is going to be one of okay. And for that to be the case, you want your monad to be symmetric monoidal or equivalently strong and strong commutative and a fine. So strong monoidal, uh, strong community basically tells you that you have a map 
from the probabilities of the product to the product of the probabilities, and not just the other way around. You also come up the other way by the universal property. So this is something you want to why. Okay? Which kind of tells you that the product of the probabilities is a special case of the probability of the product for the situation of no interruption. And then the affinity is kind of telling you that probabilities are normalized to one. Again, <coughs> you don't have to require this. It just makes things a little bit more complicated. You can always just do measures. But this makes things a lot simpler. And since we're talking about probability monads, not measure monads, we are required. So for a concrete example, what I'll stop is the classic category. It's the classic category of the famous Giri monad on the category of broad space. Um, for those who are not Giri in 82, wrote her thesis with Lovier, and that's the only other time that we know Lovier did any categorical probability. And that was already more than 20 years after his first uh, definition of stop. So you find this. At that time, monads did not uh, exist. Uh, 20 years later, a student of learn defined this category as uh, by the category. So why does this come into picture? Uh, again, uh, this is from the work of uh, Hoff that uh, even argued that uh, commutative monads give you something like generalized theories of distributions, and well, definitely probability theory is the theory of distributions with other things. The idea is that um, if you have a chrysomorphism and another chrysomorphism, you want to form their product, but you need a way of going from here to here, and that's this one. And then all the coherences are satisfied. Okay, I promise to introduce a property, here it is. Um, so we have the adjunction here, the Kleisley adjunction, or if you want the definition of Kleisley category. If you take the identity here, and apply the Unetta lemma, you get a universal map from Ky to Y, such that every map in the Kleisley category, so every so say, random morphism, is the composition of this one with other guys, with something coming from the origin of the category. So this is a map that makes everything random. I want to argue this is a sampling map. People in probabilistic programming use this a lot. So that's one of the reasons why what do you apply to probabilistic programming? What does this do? Uh, you might know from basic probability that uh, sometimes you have processes such as Bernoulli of P, for example, P is one half, and that's a random variable of flipping a coin with this bias. What does this do? It takes a probability measure and gives you something random that is distributing according to that measure. So you have some probability measure here, and you get a random element of y that's distributing according to this one. Of course, this is an interpretation. And what this really is is just a chrysomorphism coming from here. But probability theory can be seen as in some sense living in this class of category, and you can describe it categorically this way. And all the randomness come from here. At some point, you non deterministically go from a particular distribution to something random distributed according to this one. So again, it's not just fully random, you know the law it's following, and that's kind of the whole point of uh, why probability theory is predicted. Alright, so these are probability moments, and now you probably know, again by the work of Koch, that affinity is the same as saying that this diagram commute, where now this is the model structure we just talked about, and this is the universal map from the functor of the limits to the limits of the functors, the comparison morphism. This thing gives you the identity when the monad is defined, which is kind of telling you that if x and y are independent, and you consider them as interacting with trivial, once you separate them again, you get the two marginals you start with. What you do not <coughs> have is that is the other one. So it is not true that if two things are interacting and you separate them, then take the product, you do not recover the interaction initially. That's actually, that would make these two maps isomorphisms and would make the monad strong monad. You might know that a strong monad, a monad on a Cartesian monad category gives you a Cartesian <coughs> Kleisley category. And it cannot have that. So, the no product condition in terms of monads is much simpler. We're saying that the comparison map between functor of the limit and limit of the functor is not an isomorphism. Now, though, let's go to the infinite product. So we have, again, uh, the same thing, but now with infinite Cartesian products. And so we don't have to expect this to be an isomorphism either. However, remember that we can express the infinite product as a <coughs> co of finite ones. 
So that we can split this morphism into uh, these maps, where now you first take the limit out of the functor, and then you take also the product out of the functor. Okay? So it's a two-stage limit. And we know that this map is not a isomorphism because this is just f many times this one. So probability of the, on this product is not a product of the probabilities. However, what Kolmogorov's extension theorem tells you is that this map is a isomorphism. In other words, there are interactions, stochastic interactions, correlations, that prevent you from they prevent this map from being an isomorphism. So the product of finitely many things is not the same as this. However, once you go to infinite, you don't get any extra correlations. There is no such thing as an infinitary correlation. And it's a little bit like when you have a finite ring monad, where you can form arbitrarily large operations in there, like through like the associated linear theory that is set. But there's no such thing as an infinity operation, just finite and arbitrarily large. This is the same, and instead of having that the functor commutes with filtered coordinates, it commutes with co-filtered limits, or at least with this one co-filtered limit. But we have reason to believe that maybe it's all of them. Again, you might have heard something like that in Monday's talk of Ruben. So, this, I've not seen this anywhere. The, the closest thing I've seen to this is so people were talking about finitely co-monads, so if you take the opposite category, it's exactly this. But, um, but it's not very much studied. So monads that are kind of like finitary, but like for correlations instead of for, for taking units. And Kolmogorov's extension theorem can equivalently be stated as the fact that this map here is a isomorphism. So the correlations are infinitary. Uh, sorry, they are finitary or really pro finitary. Uh, there's no accepted term here. That's the universal problem we might want to look at. And we might want this one to be an additional axiom that we want to require for the least one. We call it the Kolmogorov axiom or something. Right. Another related property, which, uh, I mean, they're related in, in spirit, but we don't know if, it's, if they imply mathematically one another. It's another way, yet another way, in which the probability monads of, say, measures are instances finitary, which is, let's do like this. So you can test probability measures for equality by taking a finite but arbitrarily large number of independent observations. That's what people do in statistics or even in all experimental sciences. You want to see what a certain distribution process follows, you just take a lot of repeated experiments, right? If you can. Kind of doing things like this one, which is very expensive and um, So, what's that categorically? All right. So, we have PS, and the probability measure here would be something like a morphism. Right? And we want to say that if you copy finitely but arbitrarily large many times and sample using the universal map of the collective rejection, then for all n, this family is jointly monic. It's a jointly monic source. Of course, if the Kolmogorov products exist, that's the same thing as this whenever, whenever thing works. Okay. So that's again something that is satisfied by the Giri monad. It's uh, an easy consequence of the uh, monotone class theorem or finite theorem. And that's again something that seems to specify probability to a very large degree. So this might be an additional axiom that we want. And now, what do we, why do we want this? Because I want to say this is very central to the practice of probability and for sure for statistics. Before we go to the actual universal property here, <coughs> let's give a very practical example because there is a lot of confusion in saying what it means to test things in finite distribution. So, suppose you flip a coin. In Belgium, they have a one euro face and a king face. And uh, suppose you get like one euro, one euro, one euro, one euro, and you keep getting stuff like this. Let's say five times. Now, what do you expect next? All right, uh, you have all heard people, usually without a background in mathematics, that say, well, this number has not come out of the lottery in ages, now it's time for that. You all know that's not a good model, right? 
So let's start to imagine we're doing scientific experiments. Suppose you're a biologist and you have a fish and you want to see if this fish prefers cold or lukewarm water. And this fish always chooses warm, 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 warm. What do you expect next? Certainly not, it's time for a cold bath now. You're probably thinking, you have discovered something about that fish, right? So, we might start suspecting that there's something up, and so this side of the coin is a better bet. All right? However, some of you might see, might see a problem with this, because usually, how do you argue to the people that have that stuff with the lottery? You usually tell them, well, the numbers of the lottery have no memory, right? And why would that not apply here? Okay, you could say the fish has memory, okay, but su suppose you have different fish of the same species and you still see the same behavior, right? Then they can have a, I mean, either they have a high mind, but uh, we cannot have that. So, what's going on here? Um, where are the conflicts independent? And if they were, how is it possible that knowing the past can tell you something about the future? Okay? So, one thing that you can do here, if you get this, um, this sequence, is take a look at the coin carefully, and suppose you see that the coin is perfectly fair. It's not loaded, there's no way, it has two different sides, and so on. And so you say, all right, this was just a lucky strike. What do I expect next? 50-50. This was just luck, all right? Okay, so what's going on here? <coughs> Well, given the distribution, if you're sure about the distribution, the coin flips are independent. But if you don't know the distribution, then there is some randomness which has shared information between the flips. What do they have in common that you don't know? That they are the same coin. That they, that, that they follow the same distribution, and you don't know the distribution. So it's withholding information from you because of some randomness. And we know now, using our commutative diagrams, that we can express this categorically. Remember, is it about splitting this diagram? So this thing of withholding information is, not, is a little bit involved. But we categorically, we can make it absolutely straightforward, which is, this is what's going on. You have some randomness and uncertainty about what the law, what's the probability involved here. And so you see that this diagram overall cannot be split, right? Because there's this kind. But remember that we proved that if this is deterministic, deterministic things can be split. So if we are certain about what law the coin is following, then this can be split. And these things are actually independent. Okay? So it's just a string diagram kind of thing. And that takes us to the last thing we want to talk about, which is the Fidelis theorem, which is a limit. So <coughs> These repeated coin flips, we have said, are not independent in general, they, but they are exchangeable. In the sense that if you, if you imagine permute the first and the second coin flip, you don't expect overall the distribution to change, right? And same thing with the first and the tenth, and so on. So, you call a morphism here, for example, a state, but let's keep a uh, new input, exchangeable, if you commute with I want to say infinite permutations of the components, by which I mean finite permutation, but unbounded. It's quite arbitrary now. So these are less than the isomorphisms of n. Okay? And um, you call this process exchangeable, and you see you can express this categorically as this commutative diagram, it's just a commutative triangle. And again, so far it's just a language, but as categories, we expect this to have a limit, maybe. And that is exactly what the Fibonacci theorem says. So then, in Borel's talk, Px is the limit of this diagram, so it's a limiting cone, which tells us that there is a natural bijection between exchangeable <coughs> probability measures on these sequences and Morphisms into Px, which are, in some sense, parameterized probability measures over probability measures. Okay, random maps into here. 
And the universal cone, the limited cone, is exactly this one of making repeated experiments. So let's first of all say this is a very old theorem in probability. It's from 1927. However, if you look at the archive of probability, still in the land, in the, in the current decades, people are publishing novel and novel proofs of definitive, as if they're not satisfied with that proof. Because, not because the proof is wrong, of course the proof is right. But we've all run into those proofs that technically do prove the statement, but do not explain very well what's going on in a way that's satisfactory to the human being. Right? Um, we made this worse by adding another proof. No, but we are very satisfied with ours. Okay? And I'm going to let you briefly explain what's going on in the proof in the next slide. So it's very clear. But even just the statement here is very clear because, first of all, why was this complicated about talking about you know random things in TPS? So random probability measures, or probability measures over probability measures. Well, because before categorical probability, people were not using monads. And monads make this very systematic. But also because uh, the universal arrows of the cone are crucially not deterministic. Okay? This is involves the sample map, which is like the maximally non-deterministic thing. So this is not, like before with the Kolmogorov thing, when you restrict to just deterministic morphisms, you get a good old product, right? So it's a product that you had to begin with, and the, this filtered part is preserved by your function. Here, though, to see this is a limit, you have to go in a category where the arrows are running, like where the arrows are determined. So categories that people have not looked at very much. And the only way to see this is a limit is to allow for these stochastic things that do not, commit, that, that, that do not give you, for example, Cartesian products. So it's something that we really gain by uh, having more than known Cartesian products. And, um, Let's maybe look at the proof. Sorry, can you clarify oh, yeah. the state? Because what shape of diagram? Oh, this is um, maybe the way to write this is something like this. So we have x to the n. And the shape of the diagram is really like something like this. Like it's a, it's a group action. With all the permutations. All the permutations, yes. Yeah, so I wrote this as just one map, but we have to imagine it. Okay. You mean like uh, finite, but are finite uh, uh, permutations, not... Uh, All the finite ones, but are like of an unbounded number. So you can permit the first five entries, six entries, and so on. You don't have stuff like, uh, let's put an odd number and two even numbers, then one odd number and three even numbers, and so on. That will also give you an isomorphism of n. But that's not an infinite permutation. Uh, not a finite permutation. We don't want those. Because those would give you instances in different uh, ratios in the long run. Probability is all about ratios. So that would, um, that would work. But the finite ones work, and that's also the original statement of the finite. Um, all right, so what's the proof? Let's do it for the case of states. Um, this state is exchangeable, and we have to use a Markov categorical <coughs> conditional, which is the thing that would give you conditional probability usually. Which is like, we can find the morphism from xn to x such that the first factor of all these uh, all identical factors can be just reconstructed from the other ones. And this is just by using the axioms of the market cap. And uh, that's basically it. <coughs> Oops, sorry. Now, this map, T, under the universal property of Claisley is the same thing as a deterministic map into Px. This one. We put it here, and now you can prove that every exchangeable morphism P factors uniquely through here by just post-composing with this T sharp. It's something actually very close to a to a Limit that's also a cold limit, but, uh, but to make that precise one, I have to go to a different cap. Right? So it's a little bit like the thing you do when you split time importance. Yeah. And that's just it. That proves definitely. Uh, okay, you have to do this also for the case that P has an input, but it's 
So it's a bit more complicated than the conditional that way, but it's the same idea. Right. So it's a very simple proof, just categorical. And um, what does this also tell us? And uh, that's like where I like this very much. Uh, what's the uh, personal interpretation of this statement? So that's not mathematical, that's just me. But codes over these diagrams give you a pre-sheaf. And the limit is exactly representing object of this pre-sheaf. So in some sense, we're saying that Px with probability measures represent, in the sense of representing the pre-sheaf, represent exchangeable processes. OK? So that actually specifies the space of probability measures uniquely. So in my opinion, this is a good way to say categorically what probability really is. Because this is the limiting cone. So this tells us, by observationality of before, that taking identical repeated experiments allows you to tell two probability measures apart. But the fact that there's a uniqueness and, and existence tells you that that's also precisely what you can learn about probability by these experiments. So in some sense, this is telling us that probabilities are exactly those things that you can learn by taking repeated independent experiments. And uh, if you think of what statistics is about, what all experimental sciences is about, I think uh, this is a very good way to make this precise category. It does seem, in a certain sense, what probability is. Then you can, of course, have a Bayesian interpretation and start with some primer and then update in making experiments. Or there's frequentist people that know that's just what you put. But in the limit, and here we're like in the, in the limit situation, those things agree. So this is like above this debate between Bayesian and frequentist. So what this tells you really is, again, uh, this is just me, but I'm very satisfied by this because it tells us really what probabilities are. Are the things you can test when you take experiments? And uh, that's just the universal property of the limit. OK, last thing I want to say, these are not the only universal properties we have. These are just the ones I wanted to talk about. There's a lot of things in probability that look like co limits, and part of what work was showing that those actually are co limits in the right category. The fact that measures are positive and negative is again something like a the universal property that you can preserve. And uh, future work or like work in progress is that splitting idempotents are also extremely important <coughs> in probability they have to do with uh, equilibrium things. So after a transition, they stay the same, so there's idempotents involved there. And uh, with my master's student, no answer yet now we're uh, trying to make precise this idea of these universal properties that only hold hope almost surely, up to measure zero. We think there's a category which is a little bit like the homotopy category or something that gives us weaker equivalence just up to measure zero and um, are making this precise. So here are some references and uh, I'll stop here. Uh, I want to say, oh yeah, I wanted to say this because uh, uh, there hasn't been much um, interest in categorical probabilities in the past few decades. This is changing. One of the reasons is that people thought that probability would not be very highly structured as a field. But what we seem to be finding is that, is that there are a lot of deep structures, there are lots of universal properties, and so if you look at probability theory in the right way, these things are very deep and of course very subjectively, but I also find them extremely pleasing aesthetic. <coughs> so thanks for your attention and some references. We have time for a few questions, please. Yes. Um, thanks for such a nice talk. You expressed the desire to have an axiomatic definition of probability in my mind. And this uh, follows on from an older goal that people have had in categorical approaches to functional analysis to have a lay our hands on what a measure one hand is. I'm thinking, for example, the work of Rory Lucish and Wright. Yes. And um, my question to you is. Would you want to count the ultra-filter monad as a probability monad? Because on the one hand, an ultra-filter on the set is a finely actual probability measure where everything has probability 0 or 1. On the other hand, it's not a commutative monad, integrating um, against it fails the Fabini theorem. So what's your opinion? Uh, so, 
since we don't have this commutativity, we don't have the probability, this doesn't give us a Markov carrier. So I would not use this as a, as a probability monad. But um, for other properties, it's still very, very similar to one of them. So I think one should have like a, um, an axiomatization of things like either measures or distribution monads. And that should certainly should include the, the outer filter monad for that uh, Also, I'm not sure if all this, uh, if this, uh, if these like other finite theoretic conditions are true for the outer filter monad. I have not checked. But like independently of like the probability business, I think that would be like a quite interesting question. But I don't know. Thank you. Please. So you have any information for the classification of a probability monad, whatever it would be monad? Yeah. But what about the other monad? Oh, yes. Uh, Islander mode categories tend to be abstract convex sets or abstract convex spaces of some sort. In the sense that um, if you have a probability measure, then you want to say that for, uh, formally, um, say a probability measure over the coin is something like uh, a formal <coughs> complex combination. So one head, one half heads plus one half tails. But of course, the, the coin is not a complex. You, can actually, you cannot actually take this midpoint, right? Um, but in some situations, such as on the unit interval, for example, you have a half of this and a half of this. This can give you an actual result of that expected value. So, there is, uh, in many cases, an adjunction between uh, these generalized convex sets of convex spaces. Um, so you have a forgetful functor to set or topological spaces and the left joint. And uh, the resulting monad is one of these probability monads. So, in some sense, are spaces that are equipped with the notion of taking midpoints or centers of masses or expectation values, uh, such as, I don't know, sometimes we have numbers, those that are convex. Convex regions and vector spaces usually do that. Yes? So, uh, Sorry, we have to proceed with the problem, so let's thank the speaker. 